I can see the participants are shuffling in, numbers going up. I'll give it a few more seconds for people to, to get in. Welcome everybody to the fifth and final session of the ninth annual Vermont Center on Behavior and Health Conference. Um, numbers seem to be slowing down, so I'll move ahead with getting started. Um, my name is Eric Threlkill. I'm faculty in the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. Uh, I study decision making and behavioral risk factors for smoking and other substance use. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to serve as moderator uh, for this fifth and final session of the conference this year. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to go over the session logistics one more time. Uh, so the chat function is live for everybody to introduce themselves to one another during the, during the session and to foster conversation. Um, each speaker will present and then there will be a Q&A discussion to follow. Um, so please share your questions in the Q&A section at any time during the presentations. Uh, and these questions will be uh, moderated by me uh, during the Q&A portion of the session. So please ask as many questions as you possibly can. I'd appreciate it. Uh, questions in the chat will not be shared with our speakers. Um, and just to remind you, the session is being recorded and will be posted on our website and YouTube channel for on-demand viewing following the conference. Okay, so we have three speakers in this session. Eric Donnie comes from us, comes to us from Wake Forest University, and he'll be presenting first on nicotine reduction and smoking. Uh, Jennifer Tidy from Brown will then present on nicotine reduction and smoking in vulnerable populations. And then our, our very own Andrea, Andrea Valenti um, will present on messaging around nicotine content and cigarettes. Okay. So please type your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I will stop sharing and introduce our first speaker. Um, <clears throat> so Dr. Eric Donnie is professor of physio physiology and pharmacology, as well as professor of social sciences and health policy at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. He directs the Tobacco Control Center for Excellence at Wake Forest, which was established in 2017. For the past nine years, he has directed the Center for the Evaluation of Nicotine in Cigarettes, an NIDA FDA-funded cooperative agreement that aims to increase understanding of how behavior and health might be affected if the nicotine content of cigarettes is greatly reduced. His work focuses on the behavioral, pharmacolog pharmacological, and neurobiological mechanisms underlying nicotine use and dependence. And his more recent focus is on the regulatory approaches to reducing the health burden of tobacco. His talk today will be on nicotine reduction and smoking. So you can take it away, Eric. I'm very pleased to have you here. Oh, you're muted. Well, it happened, but I got it. Um, I assume you can see my slides okay now. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be here to talk to you about nicotine reduction um, and the role it might play as an end game strategy for smoking. So my only disclosure is that I received funding in the form of a center grant from NIH and FDA um, on the topic of nicotine product standards. And of course, the ideas I express here are my own um, and don't represent their views in any uh, official way. Um, I also want to acknowledge how blessed I've been with a laundry list of collaborators associated with Scenic, um, the center that, that Dorothy and I co-direct. Um, and it's really been an honor to work with them. Um, and they've certainly influenced much of my thinking uh, in this area. So to me, um, we must start any and all conversations about tobacco products with this simple fact. Um, cigarettes are, when used as intended, the most lethal legal product available to consumers. This has been the case for over 100 years, more than 50 of which occurred well after the health effects uh, were widely uh, recognized. So the question we have to ask ourselves is what can and should be done about it? Um, of course, we've done a lot. Um, we monitor use and try to prevent youth uptake. Uh, we protect people from secondhand smoke. We offer assistance in quitting. Uh, we warn people about the dangers. 
Um, we enforce bans related to advertising and, and we tax cigarettes to drive down use. Um, we aren't perfect at these methods. Um, there's a lot more that needs to be done, especially in areas like my home state of North Carolina now, um, and for some disadvantaged groups. Um, but I'm not convinced that these alone are adequate for the protection of public health at this point. So despite the progress made over uh, almost 60 years of tobacco control efforts in the United States, over 30 million Americans still smoke. Um, and that burden is disproportionately borne by marginalized groups, people with psychiatric disorders, the LGBTQ community, and people who are living below the poverty level. The other thing I think we have to keep in mind um, when we're talking about tobacco control is that time very much matters. That is, we want to get as many people moving away from the risks associated with smoking as fast as possible. It simply isn't acceptable to be passive about this. Nearly half a million Americans continue to die from smoking each and every year. And we know that when people quit, they decrease their risk dramatically. So each year we don't do enough to facilitate quitting costs many thousands of lives. And this has been the case arguably since 1964 or even earlier. So what I wanna to do today is argue uh, that we must take um, two complementary approaches. One that many think of as a more invasive policy that pushes people away from smoking, and the other that pulls them towards an alternative source of nicotine. I've spent a good part of the past decade doing research on the push side of that um, uh, idea of tobacco product regulation and examining what might happen if the FDA were to mandate a significant reduction in the amount of nicotine allowed in cigarettes. So the FDA has had this power since 2009 when Congress passed the Tobacco Control Act, which explicitly enabled the FDA to set standards for tobacco products, including for the amount of nicotine allowed in the product. The rationale here is really quite simple. Um, nicotine through its neuropharmacological actions motivates behavior. Um, it functions as a reinforcer and ultimately over time as, as, a, as something that um, um, supports dependence. And the currently the primary target behavior uh, is smoking. Cigarettes as a means of nicotine delivery, as we talked about, were, are deadly. Um, so if we reduce the amount of nicotine in cigarettes enough, we're likely to render those products less reinforcing or addictive. And if that is true, um, then reducing nicotine could reduce the initiation, increase cessation, and reduce relapse. And it is that change in behavior that would dramatically improve public health. So what do clinical studies of low nicotine cigarettes find? First, as Neil showed um, yesterday morning, um, reducing nicotine from um, the typical levels of about 16 milligrams per gram of tobacco to 2.4 milligrams per gram or less decreases the number of cigarettes smoked. So on the left are data from the first large clinical trial that we published back in 2015 now. And on the right are data from Steve's group here at Vermont and both show very clear declines in the number of cigarettes smoked per day as you reduce the nicotine content um, of a cigarette. As expected, reducing nicotine in cigarettes also reduces exposure to nicotine. So here are data from that 2015 trial we conducted and from a recent paper from the Penn State group, both of which show decreases in urinary biomarkers of nicotine exposure related to whether people were randomized to the very low nicotine content cigarettes. One of the biggest concerns people have is based on intuition um, and the history of light cigarettes which suggests that people might compensate for the reduction in nicotine content by smoking more, so-called compensatory smoking. And as I already showed you, people don't smoke, they smoke fewer cigarettes, not more, um, if you randomize them to the low nicotine content cigarettes. They also don't compensate by smoking those cigarettes even harder. So shown here are data from literally thousands of cigarette butt filters that we sent to the CDC, where they can estimate mouth level intake of nicotine um, on a per cigarette basis from our clinical trials. And what we found was that yes, if nicotine content was only moderately or modestly reduced that 5.2 milligram per gram group, then it is possible and people do try to compensate. 
However, if nicotine content is reduced to those low levels we discussed before, we don't see any evidence of compensatory smoking, even at the cigarette level. Smokers are also somewhat surprised that they don't smoke more. This is an interesting quote from a small study we ran out of a, out of a hotel, actually, where we could fully control the environment. Participants stayed in their uh, hotel uh, in the hotel for four nights and were given a bank account in which they could purchase cigarettes assigned to them. And in this study, we actually told them what they were smoking. So this study was unblinded. And here's this participant. This is what this participant said. What I what my thoughts were and what the reality was was two totally different ideas. You know, my thought was they're going to be nasty. They're going to not even taste anything. But going, uh, I'm going to smoke like a freight train and try to end, uh, make up for the nicotine my body is craving. And it ended up not even coming out that way. Reducing nicotine is also likely to increase smoking cessation. Indeed, studies have consistently found um, reductions in nicotine dependence in participants randomized to very low nicotine content cigarettes. However, most studies aren't powered sufficiently to look at actual quitting, especially in participants who are recruited based on the idea that they are not interested in quitting at the start of the study. Probably the best study we have is, the, is a trial of 1,250 smokers that we ran and uh, that Dorothy Hatsukami was the first author on um, that compared immediate to gradual reduction of nicotine content over a 20-week period. In that trial, immediate reduction to the lowest levels of nicotine, 0.4 milligrams per gram of tobacco, significantly increased abstinence at the end of the trial with an odds ratio of over three, suggesting that it is even in a population of participants who are not looking to quit that we're likely to see cessation if um, participants switch to low nicotine cigarettes. Participants also comment on the potential of quitting during the qualitative interviews I described before. So here's a few quotes um, related to that. And so I've been able to cut down on smoking. I don't seem to be as needy on the cigarettes. It makes me want to just go ahead and quit, to put them down. And my favorite one, uh, I actually finally feel like cigarettes aren't controlling me. Although we don't see much evidence of compensation and we do see evidence of quitting, um, we, the other thing we see is that is non-adherence or cheating. We estimate that about 75 to 80% of the participants in our early trials use at least some non-study cigarettes. And this number appears to be better, maybe um, less than half in more recent trials where we use financial incentives to increase compliance. But nevertheless, many people are supplementing their regular, uh, supplementing their use of cigarettes, their VLNC cigarettes, or very low nicotine content cigarettes, with the use of regular commercially available cigarettes, suggesting they're continuing to seek nicotine in some other form. Participants assigned to the very low nicotine content cigarettes are also more likely to drop out of our studies. Here, these are data from actually the Penn State study, um, uh, where you can see a uh, more rapid dropout in the reduced nicotine content condition. <clears throat> Non-adherence is, um, of course, a challenge for interpreting the data of any clinical trial. In, in our case, we might expect that both the benefits and the risks of nicotine reduction to get larger if regulation essentially forced adherence. However, a potentially bigger concern is whether non-adherence is kind of the canary in the coal mine um, for a potential illicit market, more uh, and maybe more severe withdrawal symptoms um, for some individuals or other unintended consequences, and that we need to understand how to mitigate um, those potential risks. So one approach to mitigating withdrawal um, is to provide smokers with nicotine replacement therapy. Um, which we know is safe to use and effective at suppressing withdrawal during quit attempts. So this led us to conduct another clinical trial um, in which we randomized smokers in a two by two design. Participants were given either a low nicotine or normal nicotine content cigarette and half the participants received a transdermal nicotine patch. We found that the very low nicotine content cigarette reduced smoking as we had seen many times before. Um, and that concurrent treatment with the nicotine patch also reduced smoking when participants smoked normal nicotine content cigarettes. However, the patch did very little to add to the effects of VLNC cigarettes. That is, transdermal nicotine didn't facilitate any further decline in smoking as we might have hoped. 
The patch did um, reduce the percentage of participants who reported using non-study cigarettes. So this is important, and it suggests that if nicotine reduction policy were pursued, having readily available medicinal nicotine as an alternative might be helpful. That said, we must also recognize that about half of the participants still cheated, um, more, than, uh, more than those that smoked the, VL, the normal nicotine content cigarettes, suggesting that medicinal nicotine may not be enough to drive down non-adherence. So why is the patch not enough? Um, as a substitute? Well, at this point, I think it's important that we pause and we think more about what's really happening here. Um, we are essentially degrading the value of one reinforcer, the steady cigarette, and at least some of the people choose to use an alternative, non-steady cigarettes, providing the drug back as a patch, a route of administration that has very little reinforcing value doesn't solve the problem. Indeed, probably the best way to think about the behavioral impact of regulations, um, including very low nicotine product standards, is to think about its impact on the full range of choices available to the consumer. So essentially, reducing nicotine in cigarettes will reduce their appeal and render them minimally or non-addictive, and it's going to lead to behavior change, but we don't get to dictate the nature of that change. <clears throat> Ideally, people will stop using tobacco altogether, and maybe use medications shown to be safe and effective. However, we also have to consider the possibility that they're gonna to turn to other tobacco products and those products could vary in the harm that they produce. Finally, they could turn to illicit cigarettes um, and what behaviors dominate is gonna depend at least in part on the range of other products available to them, both licit and illicit. So if we really want to model the real world impact of a potential policy like this, a better way to approach our clinical research may be to provide alternatives to people and measure not only whether smoking changes when you reduce a nicotine, but whether other behavior change occurs as well. <clears throat> so my colleague Dorothy Atsukami published the first trial like this a few years back where she provided smokers low nicotine content cigarettes and alternative nicotine products. And what she found in that pilot study was that reducing nicotine content was associated with an increase in the use of alternative products, most commonly e-cigarettes. And conversely, when those alternative products were used, that, the, uh, that was associated with an increased number of days in which those participants were abstinent from cigarettes. So these data really highlight the potential bi-directional relationship um, of, or the nature of, the, of product use interactions and how nicotine reduction may drive increases in the use of appealing alternatives, which in turn may further reduce smoking of the very low nicotine content cigarettes. So we're currently conducting a larger and more uh, pragmatic trial that examines the impact of nicotine reduction within the context of, of this larger, um, what we call an experimental tobacco marketplace. In this study, <clears throat> participants have an, a bank account and for 12 weeks, they get to purchase whatever products they want from our online store. Um, they're randomized to one of two conditions. In one store, the cigarettes only have normal amounts of nicotine in in them, and in the other store, the cigarettes only, uh, only cigarettes available are very low nicotine content cigarettes. The rest of the marketplace is identical. Um, so in this and other ongoing studies, we're really interested in the characteristics of the alternatives that, ch um, that they choose over cigarettes and whether for some individuals, for example, youth, um, whether those alternatives are particularly important and whether they respond differently to the market conditions. So as you can see, um, we're kind of drifting into the other approach I mentioned at the beginning, those so-called pull factors, creating a marketplace in which smokers might voluntarily switch to less harmful products. Um, and this really raises an important question in my mind. Uh, if these other products are available, is nicotine reduction even necessary? Or is the availability of those harmful alternatives sufficient to bring us to the end of combusted tobacco product use? Reducing nicotine is a very intrusive policy. And the more intrusive policies um, really require that we reflect on whether that action is needed or whether less intrusive interventions might achieve the same goal. <clears throat> so understandably, many people are concerned about use, use of alternative nicotine delivery systems like e-cigarettes. But for today, I wanna focus on their utility to reduce harm in current smokers. 
So the short answer um, that I believe about in terms of sufficiency is that um, alternative not, I don't believe that alternative non-combusted sources of nicotine are likely to reduce the harms associated with smoking, um, at least not um, in the time frame um, that I think is necessary. So let me show you some reasons why. So these data are from Great Britain, actually, um, and they show the percentages of current adult smokers who have ever tried, uh, tried but not currently use, and currently use e-cigarettes. As you can see, there was some rapid growth um, in experimentation with e-cigarettes between 12, 2012 and 2015. However, since then, the percentage of smokers who have tried e-cigarettes has begun to level off. Indeed, about 34 30 to 35 percent of current smokers have never tried e-cigarettes, and this has been pretty true for the last five years. So that was in people who smoke, but maybe that's um, that lack of trying e-cigarettes is because um, smoking rates have declined so dramatically in Great Britain that uh, only the most diehard smokers are left, and sadly that's not the case. Progress is, uh, continues to be made, and e-cigarettes are likely adding to smoking cessation but I don't see any evidence of a precipitous drop in the prevalence of smoking since the onset of vaping. This is despite the fact that since 2016, Great Britain, unlike the United States, has aggressively communicated um, that vaping is safer than smoking and that people should switch to improve their health. Accurately communicating health risks is really important, as Andrea will discuss, um, but we should not assume that doing so will effectively end the use of cigarettes. Even where relative harms are clearly made, um, uh, of, uh, are clearly communicated to the public, cigarettes remain the predominant form of nicotine use. So why are more uh, smokers trying these cigarettes? So here are a few of the reasons that they give. The top reason, uh, I do not want to substitute one addiction for another. Other common reasons have to do with not thinking they are needed or, um, or that they would be useful for quitting or that they lack information about their effects. Those are the reasons that people may not try them. How about those individuals who do try e-cigarettes but keep smoking anyway? In many ways, they're the most interesting and important group for me um, to understand. Why don't they switch? like Public Health England and the Royal College of Physicians recommends. Um, the number one reason they give, um, they didn't feel like smoking a cigarette. Um, and number two, they didn't help me deal with the cravings for smoking. So the, these should remind us um, that substituting one product for another isn't as easy as providing another source of nicotine. Cigarettes, not just nicotine, are the product that far too many people find themselves dependent on. So that takes us back to this idea um, that maybe we need both push and pull approaches to end smoking once and for all. So the last question we have to grapple with um, is what alternatives are necessary or sufficient um, within the context of reduced nicotine products or cigarettes? We may not need or want all sorts of flavors that attract kids, for example, to vaping, but if they don't help smokers transition away from cigarettes. Similar questions, of course, could be asked of nicotine delivery. Are products that are highly effective at delivering nicotine necessary to help adult smokers? So we recently analyzed data um, relevant to this question from a study that we had to terminate, we decided to terminate early. So in this study, we randomized participants in a two by two by two design. All participants were provided with a steady cigarette and an e-cigarette. Half of um, the participants received a cigarette with very low nicotine content and the other half a normal nicotine content cigarette. Similarly, for the e-cigarette, which was a vape pen, um, we randomized people to receive either a low or moderate level of nicotine in the e-liquid and to have availability of tobacco only or tobacco and non-tobacco flavors, including mint, fruit, and dessert options. All participants were daily smokers who experienced e-cigarettes, but, but we excluded people who were regularly using e-cigarettes, at least as defined by more than 15 days in the past month. So as I mentioned, we decided to terminate this study um, before its target sample size. And the, the primary reason we did this is because of the rapidly changing marketplace. Those of you that work in, in clinical trials in this area, I think will appreciate this challenge. We felt like we were, um, we were um, 
studying a product that may be uh, far less relevant than it was when we started the project with the emergence of Juul and disposables like Puff Bar. Um, and we also felt that the, we also were concerned that the products we were using were made by manufacturers that were going to be unlikely to be able to gain the pre-market approval from the FDA that's needed for them to require uh, to remain on the market. So we decided to terminate and switch to a different strategy um, that I'm happy to answer questions about. <clears throat> Nevertheless, we analyzed the data we did have. And what we found um, at that point was that providing a vape pen, whether it had low or moderate levels of nicotine, um, didn't really matter for people who were assigned a normal nicotine content cigarette. They continued to smoke at levels seen during the baseline period. When participants were given a low nicotine cigarette and a low nicotine e-cigarette, they reduced how much they smoked, about seven cigarettes per day, which is the, about the effect size we've seen in other clinical trials. Um, however, when participants were given a, a vape pen with moderate levels of nicotine, the impact of reducing nicotine in cigarettes was al almost twice as large. What about the flavor manipulation? Um, well, the long story short is that the flavor data um, were more variable and, and produced less consistent, non-significant effects, um, but it'd be misleading to say flavor had no impact. Uh, relative to normal nicotine content cigarettes, those assigned to the VLNC cigarettes smoked less at week 12, and overall that reduction was greatest amongst those who had the full range of flavors available to choose from. So as you can imagine, we were, um, when we saw those data, we were uh, very sad that we had terminated the study. Um, then, of course, COVID hit and it would have derailed us anyway, which in some strange way made me feel better. Um, so during COVID, we decided to take a different approach um, and to make the best of our clinic clothing and conduct a crowdsourcing study in which we asked some of the same questions about the importance of flavor and nicotine content and alternatives when nicotine is reduced. So in this study, we, we used a discrete choice procedure in which participants made hypothetical choices between two products. Over trials, the characteristics of the products varied, allowing us to calculate what the relative importance of the characteristics were in determining each individual's choice. Shown here is one trial as an example. So here a participant chooses between a cigarette um, that cigarettes that were available in menthol and non-menthol flavors, but which only had uh, low levels of nicotine, about 50% of what they were used to. And a vaping product, which was available only in, nicotine, or in, in tobacco and menthol flavors, and which also had low levels of nicotine. In other trials, the nicotine content of the cigarette and the vaping product um, varied from very low to normal or moderate. And the flavor of the e-cigarette changed, making fruit and dessert avail uh, flavors also available. Cigarette flavor wasn't manipulated. So for simplicity, um, I'm showing only a summary derived measure of the relative importance of the characteristics of the products. So importance is essentially a measure of how much sway each factor has on an individual's choice. So what we found was that when smokers were presented with these choices, whether they chose the cigarette or the vaping device depended about equally on the nicotine content of the cigarette, the green part of the, uh, of the diagram, and the nicotine content of the vaping device, the blue part. Um, but flavor, at least, in the, um, at least the addition of dessert and fruit flavors, had a much smaller impact on these hypothetical choices. So what I've hope, I hope I've convinced you of today is that the science behind nicotine reduction is, is quite strong. Um, we know that nicotine, that reducing the nicotine content of cigarettes to 2.4 milligrams and preferably much lower, say uh, 0.4 milligrams per gram, reduces smoking and consequently re reduces exposure to harmful constituents of tobacco. Smokers um, switch to very low nicotine content cigarettes do not compensate. However, if nicotine is only moderately reduced, they might. Um, I didn't talk about this today, but immediate reduction in the nicotine content of cigarettes is likely to lead to more rapid declines in smoking and improved public health. Um, but it's also going to present the greatest um, challenges in terms of discomfort and adherence. Use of very low nicotine content cigarettes is likely to increase smoking cessation um, by reducing dependence, craving, and withdrawal, and by increasing quit attempts and the probability of achieving abstinence. And lastly, reducing nicotine in cigarettes 
um, led to significant non-adherence. Most people use uh, mostly non-study uh, cigarettes, but they supplemented those with commercially available non-study cigarettes. However, I think we have to uh, we have to think carefully about how best to implement a nicotine reduction policy if we are truly going to improve public health. This includes recognizing that the behavior of individuals who smoke is only influenced, not determined by policy. Some individuals may become abstinent from nicotine and tobacco altogether. Some may keep smoking either in the form of low nicotine or illicit cigarettes, and others may try newer nicotine products that are far less um, harmful. Wait, um, waiting for these alternative products to pull smokers away from cigarettes may be inadequate to move many smokers currently, many current smokers away from smoking. So if our goal is to rapidly end the devastation caused by smoking, we may need to both nicotine reduction and harm reduction. So thank you very much for listening and I'd be happy to take questions at the end of the session. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Donnie. I appreciate that. It was a, a great summary of all this excellent work on um, nicotine reduction. And I'm sure we'll have a great discussion on it to follow. Um, but our next speaker is Dr. Jennifer Tidy. She is Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the Brown University School of Public Health, where she's affiliated with the Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies. She also holds a secondary appointment as Professor of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University. Uh, she is Associate Director of a NIDA T32 training program and Director of the CAAS Center for alcohol and addiction studies. The goals of her research are to identify mechanisms under, underlying the high rates of tobacco dependence in minority populations and to develop effective smoking cessation interventions for these individuals. Mm -hmm. She conducts research in tobacco regulatory science with special emphasis on vulnerable populations. And today she'll be speaking with us about nicotine reduction and smoking in vulnerable populations. Please Great. take it away. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Can everybody see my slides? Everything look good? Okay. Um, great, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you audience for hanging in with us to the last session. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, following up on what Eric was just talking about, what happens in vulnerable populations. Um, my support and disclosures, uh, this work is funded by grants from the NIH <clears throat> and the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. I don't have any funding from tobacco or cigarette companies, and the content is solely my responsibility and does not necessarily represent the official views of the NIH or FDA, of course. And a lot of this work is has been conducted um, in collaboration with the Scenic Center that Eric was is uh, co-leads with Dorothy Hatsukami, and with the Vermont Center on Behavioral and Health, led by Dr. Steve Higgins. Okay, so why study nicotine reduction in vulnerable populations? Um, the, the 2009 Tobacco Control Act authorized the FDA to set product standards, including a nicotine reduction standard for cigarettes. However, the FDA must consider the risks and benefits to the population as a whole when making uh, those decisions about standards. And we know that um, vulnerable populations uh, are people who smoke at the, who, who are persistent smokers and are at elevated risk for tobacco related health harms. So a reduced nicotine standard, if it reduces smoking rates and improves abstinence in um, these vulnerable populations has incredible potential to reduce health harms. Um, however, we also uh, need to assess whether vulnerable populations could experience unintended negative consequences of a reduced nicotine standard some of which I've listed here, um, the potential for increases in negative affect or other psychiatric symptoms, um, the potential for increases in, in compensatory smoking to overcome these effects, and maybe increases in alternative substance use among people who use those substances. Um, and so these are the populations of special relevance, those so-called vulnerable populations um, to the FDA Center of Tobacco Products. They include youth, 
um, socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, um, also called low SES, uh, racial and ethnic minority populations, underserved rural po populations, people with mental health conditions, people with substance use disorders, military and veteran populations, pregnant women or women of reproductive age and sexual and gender minorities. And of course, oftentimes people suffer from multiple comorbidities as well. So that's the why, and this is the how. How do we study uh, the potential impact of a reduced nicotine standard? Um, we use these very low nicotine content cigarettes that Eric was just talking about. Um, these are cigarettes that are supplied through the NIDA drug supply program. They come in a variety of nicotine contents uh, ranging from the normal nicotine content, which has 15.8 milligrams nicotine per gram tobacco, which is comparable to commercially, the nicotine content of commercially sold uh, cigarettes. Then reduced nicotine cigarettes, um, we're showing here a 5.2 milligram per gram and the very low nicotine content cigarettes ranging from 2.4 uh, to 0 0.4 milligram per gram. Um, and notably, these are under the, the threshold proposed by um, uh, Benowitz and Henningfield in 1994 when they um, came up with the idea of the, of the reduced nicotine um, standard. And so um, I'm gonna run through, a, a lot of people uh, have heard me talk about men, people with mental health conditions, which is the population that I mainly study but I'm also broadening out this talk. I'm gonna also talk about um, low SES smokers, um, some smokers who also use other substances and um, youth as well and some other populations. So starting with adults with mental health conditions, um, you can see here I've listed um, uh, five or six uh, studies. Um, these range from acute exposure studies uh, these are uh, uh, participants are brought into the laboratory, often after overnight abstinence. Um, and um, then we uh, provide cigarettes uh, varying in nicotine content and we look at effects on craving, withdrawal and smoking behavior. Um, and you can see, um, I've done a, I did a study a while back. These were with the Quest cigarettes prior to the Spectrum cigarettes in um, adults with and without schizophrenia. Um, and we found that very low nicotine content cigarettes reduced craving, withdrawal symptoms, and smoking behavior in um, both our adults with and without schizophrenia. Uh, secondary analysis found no, no indication of compensatory smoking topography in the very low nicotine content cigarettes. Um, and we did find some um, cognitive effects, uh, some reduced attention and um, inhibitory control with uh, when participants were using BLNCs and those effects were reversed with concurrent um, transdermal nicotine replacement. And um, a study, a large uh, laboratory study led by Higgins et al, 2017, using three vulnerable populations. Those were um, participants with affective disorders, low SES women um, of reproductive age and um, adults with opiate use disorders. Um, similarly found that when participants received very low nicotine content cigarettes, they were le less likely to choose to use those cigarettes. They were re reduced cigarette reinforcement on, according to behavioral tasks and also um, some demand indices and some um, subjective effects indices. Um, so what about exposure longer than a you know, single session in the laboratory? So for these types of studies, we, uh, we have a, a baseline period in which we look at um, smoking when people are just smoking their usual brand, and then participants are switched under double blind conditions to um, cigarettes with different levels of nicotine content. Um, and you can see here some studies done with six week exposure and some studies done with 12 week exposure. And one thing I wanna emphasize is that all of these participants were not seeking treatment from smoking. Um, in fact, that was a rule out because we're providing cigarettes and um, 
And so none of them were interested in treatment and we provide uh, cigarettes free of charge in these, in these studies um, to overcome any access barriers that the participants might have. So we have, uh, so I did a um, secondary analysis of um, participants from Eric Donnie's 2015 uh, study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that was a large um, 10 site study with 840 people. We did a secondary analysis looking at people who had elevated uh, depressive symptoms at baseline compared to those uh, without elevated baseline uh, depression and found that um, people with elevated depressive symptoms at baseline responded very similarly to those with lower depression. I'll show you a slide of, of that in a, in a moment or so. Um, I also led um, a single uh, site randomized controlled trial of very low nicotine content cigarettes compared to normal nicotine content on, um, in smokers with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And I'll show you those results in a moment. And um, Higgins et al led a, uh, a large um, randomized con controlled trial in the three vulnerable populations I mentioned earlier, looking at effects of cigarettes varying in nicotine content on, on smoking, um, nicotine exposure, toxin exposure, and dependence in, in those three vulnerable populations. And I'll show you slides from that as well. So this is the um, secondary analysis of the Donnie et al study. Um, that we conducted to look at whether people who had elevated depressive symptoms at baseline um, responded differently from those with lower baseline depressive symptoms to very low nicotine content cigarettes. So you can see uh, the flow of the studies that people are screened. There is a baseline period in which they use their usual brand cigarettes. And then there's a six week um, intervention period in which participants received um, study cigarettes that varied in nicotine content from 15.8 milligram per gram, which is comparable to commercially sold cigarettes, um, or very low nicotine content cigarettes with um, 2.4, 1.3, or 0 0.4 milligrams per gram nicotine. And we, um, those three conditions, we collapsed together to, get, to have enough power to try to look at this question. And, um, and then following that six week period, there was an abstinence assessment and a follow-up. And participants were seen weekly. Uh, we, they were, uh, you know, they, they, um, we administered a host of measures that they completed and um, we provided free study cigarettes during this whole um, study, as I mentioned. And so what did we find? Um, People with lower um, baseline depressive symptoms on the left and higher baseline depressive symptoms on the right. Um, so you can see in the top left graph, um, the effect of um, very low nicotine content cigarettes versus usual brand um, or 15.8 milligram per gram cigarettes on smoking. Um, you can see a reduction that was, I think on the order of about six cigarettes per day. And then if you look at the top right, you can see the effects in people who started out with higher baseline depressive symptoms, and they also have a, a significant reduction in, in cigarettes per day at week six. Um, so, uh, you know, no interaction effect. And then the, the um, graphs in the bottom show total nicotine exposure. And here you can see as well that the two groups responded very similarly to very low nicotine content cigarettes. Um, these graphs show effects on craving and withdrawal. Um, so again, the participants with lower baseline depressive symptoms on the left and those on the, with higher depression on the right. And you can see that um, those who were randomized to the very low nicotine content cigarette conditions had lower uh, cigarette craving at week six and um, lower uh, withdrawal symptoms that was not significant in the higher depression group, but was significant in the lower depression group. And very interestingly, um, effects on depressive symptoms. So on the left, you see people who started out with lower baseline depressive symptoms stayed low throughout the trial. And those who started entered the trial with higher baseline depressive symptoms, if they were randomized to the very low nicotine content conditions, they actually had a significant reduction in depressive symptoms compared to those who were randomized to the higher nicotine content. So um, certainly no 
uh, certainly we were very um, encouraged by these findings um, that for people who started out with elevated baseline depressive symptoms, um, randomization to very low nicotine content cigarettes reduced their smoking without, an inc without increasing and indeed with decreasing their, baseline, their depressive symptoms by the end of the study. Um, this is the, uh, the flow of the, um, the study that we did at Brown on in smokers with schizophrenia or, or bipolar disorder. As you can see, it it's, um, has a very similar um, design as the Donnie et al. study, um, but participants were only randomized to either 15.8 milligram per uh, gram nicotine, normal nicotine content cigarettes, or 0 0.4 milligram per gram very low nicotine content cigarettes. Again, the cigarettes were provided for uh, free throughout the study. Um, we saw participants weekly and um, they completed a slew of assessments um, during the study. Um, and these are the facts of the study in smokers with schizophrenia. So top left, you can see these are the effects on total cigarettes per day. Total cigarettes per day is the sum of um, the study cigarettes and also any non-study cigarettes that the participants reported to us um, on IVR. And you can see there was a significant reduction at week six among those randomized to the very low nicotine content cigarette condition. And um, likewise, you can see on the right, um, breath carbon monoxide level was significantly decreased among those who, who were randomized to very low nicotine content cigarettes. If you look at the bottom left, you can see this is just study cigarettes. So you can see a much bigger reduction if just study cigarettes are considered. Um, and so what that indicates, if you compare that graph to the one above it, um, you can see that the difference is non-study cigarette use um, was, uh, I, was, there was a significant amount of non-study cigarette use in this study. Um, and for that reason, we did not see actually a reduction in total nicotine exposure, um, but we did nevertheless see a decrease in um, breath CO level. However, it is important to keep in mind, um, well, let me back up for a second. We did not see any changes in psychiatric symptoms during the study, um, and we measured quite a few different um, potential psychiatric symptoms, um, but, we can't really say much about that because there was um, some fairly significant non-adherence um, during the study. And then, um, as with other studies, participants who were randomized to very low nicotine content cigarettes found them less satisfying, less rewarding. They don't re uh, reduce craving as well as higher nicotine cigarettes. Um, they're less enjoyable. And now I'm gonna turn, this is the uh, Higgins et al. Um, study in three vulnerable populations published in 2020. So again, these are um, disadvantaged women of childbearing age, adults in treatment for opiate use disorder and adults with um, current or lifetime depression or anxiety disorders. This is a very large study, uh, 775 total participants um, and um, and participants were in this study um, receiving study cigarettes for 12 weeks. Um, and again, we saw participants weekly and we had a slew of measures. And these are the outcomes from that study. So you can see um, um, a very, uh, a significant reduction in um, cigarette use among participants who received either the 2.4 or 0.4 milligram per gram cigarettes compared to those who received 15.8 milligram per gram cigarettes, um, whether you're looking at total cigarettes per day or just the study cigarettes per day. And there weren't any differences across populations um, that were notable. There were a few minor that I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, we also saw that those randomized to very low nicotine content cigarettes had uh, lower um, FTND scores at week 12, um, that's the graph on the left, and they had um, lower wisdom um, uh, smoking motives uh, scores, and that is the graph on the right. And here we did say see a little bit of a blip in depressive symptoms 
um, but it's very small. So you can see at baseline, they were around 10.5 on the BDI and the, the people with um, the people who were random, randomized to the 0 0.4 milligram per gram stayed around that level, whereas the people who were randomized to the higher nicotine content cigarettes were significantly lower. But if you look at the range, we're talking about the difference between a 10 and 11 on this um, on the scale, and they're both in the area of the minimal um, the minimal range on the BDI scale. So really, no effect on symptoms. Okay, um, what about adults who use other substances? Um, we have a couple of studies in um, people with opioid use disorders, and there have been a couple of um, secondary analysis studies in people, um, people who use cannabis versus who, those who do not use cannabis, people who use alcohol versus those who do not use alcohol. Um, so you can see there was an acute exposure study conducted in um, adults with opiate use disorder. Um, there was a six week exposure study, uh, this is, these are both secondary analysis from the Donnie et al. study. Um, the one in um, cannabis, the one that compared cannabis users to non-cannabis users found that cannabis use did not moderate the effects of very low nicotine content cigarettes on smoking, um, dependence, craving, or nicotine exposure, and did not increase cannabis use. And um, similarly, the study in alcohol users found no evidence of compensatory alcohol use or binge drinking um, among the alcohol users. Um, there was a, uh, as I mentioned a, a minute ago, um, the Higgins et al. study, um, the one in 775 participants with three vulnerable populations, included uh, one of those populations was people with opiate use disorder and um, found very similar effects across um, those participants' populations. Um, and then there was a, a secondary analysis of um, a 20 week exposure study. This is a study that compared gradual nicotine reduction, um, a step down approach to an immediate nicotine reduction to um, a normal nicotine control and found that baseline drinking and um, a SMAS score, which is a measure of um, alcohol problems, did not moderate the effects of very low nicotine content cigarettes on week 20 smoking or, or um, breath smoke. Um, and um, there was a smaller reduction of, in TNE among higher alcohol users. However, it was still a significant reduction. And um, very low, those randomized to very low nicotine content cigarettes reduced their alcohol use and their binge drinking in that study. Um, so this is outcomes again from the Higgins et al. 2020 study uh, in the three vulnerable populations. Um, we did find some slight differences in participants with opioid use disorder. Um, they still had significant reductions in total smoking, dependent severity, and um, um, breast CO level. However, there was a little bit more non-study cigarette use early in the trial a little bit more e-cigarette use, NRT use, and smokeless tobacco use during the trial. And they were also a bit less sensitive to the effects of very low nicotine content cigarettes on nicotine intake, toxicant exposure, and craving, which you can expect given um, that there was perhaps lower, lower adherence in the participants with opioid use disorder. Okay, I'm turning to adults with socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, there's a lab study, a 12-week exposure study, um, a, an 18-week gradual reduction study, and a 20-week exposure study. Um, I'm going to talk about the number three here on the list. This is a study conducted by the Penn State Group. It was a gradual reduction study, and I'll show you the design in a minute. Um, but unlike those other immediate reduction studies that I've been talking about, in this study, Participants started out with a normal nicotine content cigarette condition. And then if those in the reduction group were stepped down in nicotine content, and I think each step was three or four weeks, we'll see in the next slide, but they stepped down gradually. And the idea was that this might be an easier way for people to adapt to lower nicotine content cigarettes. You might have fewer um, unexpected negative consequences of nicotine reduction. And another really um, interesting and innovative aspect of this study 
is after they got the participants down to the lower, lowest nicotine content condition, um, participants were offered a choice of staying on their study cigarettes um, free of charge for, I, I guess, a month or two. Um, they could switch back to their usual brand cigarettes at their own expense, or they could, uh, they had, there was a treatment available that they could, um, they could um, make a quit attempt and they would receive behavioral counseling um, and NRT, oral NRT, um, if they chose to do that. And so that was one of the interesting outcomes of the study. And what they found is that people in the reduced nicotine content group were more likely to make a quit attempt and more likely to be abstinent um, one month um, after they entered that treatment. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just an interesting feature of this study and I'm, I'll, sh I'll show you the design right here. So participants came into the study, they were randomized, they had a usual brand um, baseline phase, then they were randomized. And you can see on the left, some participants stuck with, with normal ni nicotine content cigarettes and the others stepped down in nicotine content. Every three weeks they stepped down. Um, and then in weeks um, 22 to 30, that was the treatment choice phase that I um, referred to in the previous slide. And so here you can see um, one, of, one of the things they found is uh, reduced adherence and um, more attrition in the reduced nicotine content uh, group, which Eric also talked about in the preceding talk. Um, but nevertheless, they saw re reductions in nicotine exposure, um, Brasio levels, uh, total cigarettes per day and study cigarettes per day. Um, finally, some adults with other vulnerabilities. Um, there haven't been many studies of published on menthol cigarette use. Um, there's one on looking at um, the Hatsukami et al. Uh, 2018 study and uh, Denlinger et al. Denlinger Apte et al. led a, um, a secondary analysis of effects in menthol versus non-menthol smokers that I'll show you in a second. Um, a cumulative uh, vulnerability study led by Higgins et al. Um, very interestingly looking at the number of um, co-occurring vulnerability factors um, and found that that number of co-occurring vulnerabilities um, had an impact on smoking rate, but did not moderate the effects of um, nicotine reduction. And then there've been some very um, early studies in pregnant women. These are women who are smoking and don't quit when they find out they're pregnant and are not seeking treatment and not interested in quitting. A lab study found that very low nicotine content cigarettes were less satisfying, rewarding and reinforce, reinforcing than usual brand cigarettes. Um, but here's the study led by Denlinger Apte et al. Um, looking at menthol smokers. Uh, so you can see, um, so menthol smokers here are in the green lines, non-menthol smokers are in the blue lines. And you can see similar effects on cigarettes per day, um, abstinence, total nicotine equivalence, and SEMA. But you can see that the effects are a bit larger in the non-menthol smokers. Um, but both groups had reductions in these um, these um, outcome measures. And finally, I wanna to turn to youth and young adults. Um, there have been uh, five studies um, among youth and young adults, many of them led by my colleague, Rachel Cassidy. A couple of um, acute exposure studies, um, again, finding that youth who are uh, randomized to very low nicotine content cigarettes find that they reduce craving and withdrawal, but they're not very satisfying or reinforcing. Um, there was a three-week exposure study uh, conducted by Cassidy et al. in youth ages 15 through 19. Um, there was, and there have been two secondary analysis studies. One of um, the Donnie et al. study looking at young adults, 18 to 24 years old versus older adults. Um, in which the younger adults reported the very low nicotine content cigarettes were even less satisfying and rewarding um, than the older adults found them. And um, a 20 week exposure that similarly found um, no cause for alarm in younger adults. So here are results in that first secondary analysis of the Donnie et al study. So in the top left, you can see um, effects at week two. 
Younger adults are in the darker bars. Older adults, those are 25 and older, are in the lighter shaded bars. And you can see that on smoking satisfaction, the younger adults found the very low nicotine content cigarettes actually less satisfying than did the older adults. At week six, it's similar, but the, um, the, it's shifted a bit to the, to the 5.2 milligram per gram condition. And they're less, the younger adults found the very low nicotine content cigarettes less rewarding as well. And then uh, not surprisingly, they also smoked fewer of them. And this is the secondary analysis from the Hatsukami et al. 2018 study. Again, finding that among younger adults in the immediate um, switching condition, they found these cigarettes less satisfying than the, the older adults. And all of the um, adults reduced their, um, their cigarettes per day and TNEs um, when switched to very low nicotine content cigarettes. Uh, there was no interaction with age. So, okay, so to sum this up, I wanted to come back to the slide I showed at the beginning of the different um, vulnerable populations identified by the FDA Center on Tobacco Products as being of special interest. And I've discussed um, outcomes of studies that have focused on many of these vulnerable populations, as you can see here. Um, and so far, the results are pretty consistent. Um, that effects of very low nicotine content cigarettes in vulnerable, vulnerable populations are very similar to the effects in less vulnerable populations. And um, those are reduction in smoking um, without evidence of increasing psychiatric symptoms, substance use, or compensatory smoking. Um, the extent of the cigarette per day reduction is on the order of four to seven cigarettes per day. Four in um, my study of smokers with schizophrenia, seven um, in the, the Higgins, the, the large study conducted by Higgins and all across three vulnerable populations. Um, so, but I wanted to point out that we kind of stack the deck against ourselves in these studies because we're, we enroll non-treatment seeking participants and we provide them with free cigarettes. Um, and there's some indication of increased treatment seeking and quitting in the, um, among people randomized to very low nicotine content cigarettes. And that was um, clearest, I think, in the Krebs et al. study. And, um, and so next steps. So the studies that are current, currently underway are looking at um, this combined approach that Eric talked about in the preceding talk of combining um, a reduced nicotine content standard for cigarettes with um, the availability of alternative non-combusted sources of nicotine, which might increase adherence and enhance the reductions in smoking. Um, and so there is a 12 week um, study of, um, actually it should be 16. There's a 16 week study of very low nicotine content cigarettes with and without e-cigarettes in three vulnerable adult populations currently underway. And there's also a laboratory study of very low nicotine content cigarettes with and without e-cigarettes uh, varying in nicotine content and flavor, um, flavors in youth and young adults currently underway. And with that, I, am, I will I would like to thank the two teams of researchers that I've had the privilege to work with over the past almost 10 years. Um, an amazing group of scientists and really wonderful human beings. Um, committed to excellent science. And I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tidy. That was a very um, you know, comprehensive overview of all this progress that's being made in those different areas. And it's just, it's just amazing to see it all being put together like that. Um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, the next speaker, Dr. Andrea Volanti. She is an associate professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Psychological Science at the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health at the University of Vermont. Dr. Volanti is <clears throat> faculty here, and her primary focus is on adult, young adult tobacco use, using including predictors and patterns of use and interventions to reduce tobacco use in young adults and adolescents. 
She's an expert in population surveillance of tobacco and substance use and translational research to improve substance use related policy and program decision making, including tobacco regulatory science. And I'd just like to say that Dr. Volante deserves special recognition as moder moderator of this morning's session. Uh, she presented during the Lunch and Learn event sponsored by the UVM Center on Rural Addiction, and she's giving us present the final presentation of the entire conference today. Um, I just think it's a ter terrific effort on her part, um, and uh, she should be recognized for that. So she'll be giving a presentation on messaging around nicotine content and cigarettes. So please take it away, Dr. Valenti. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> and thank you for having me. Um, I'm thrilled to, to be presenting on this topic and especially on this fabulous panel um, at the end of what has been an amazing conference. So uh, I will start with my work, but just want to highlight um, and recognize that this is a tremendous effort done by a lot of people at BCBH and um, it's an honor to be presenting. So my, my presentation is gonna take a bit of a different focus. Um, we've heard a lot about the ways in which um, having randomizing participants to these low nicotine content cigarettes can change their behavior. But one of the things that um, we also need to think about in terms of policy change is how we communicate with the public about a potential change in nicotine content in cigarettes. And so that's been the focus of some of my work over the past several years. And um, so these are my disclosures. I do have funding from NIH, FDA, and HRSA. I will be presenting in this um, session research that was funded by an RO3 and, and an RO1 um, through uh, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, but everything I say today is my own responsibility and not the views of those organizations. So first, I want to talk about nicotine perceptions. Um, a few years ago, I started to do some work in the Truth Initiative Young Adult Cohort Study, where we had 4,000 participants aged 18 to 40 uh, who completed a series of items on nicotine beliefs. And a few of them really stood out as important. Um, the first was that nicotine was a cause of cancer. Uh, over half of our sample uh, endorsed that as true. Second is that a, the claim that a cigarette brand low, is low in nicotine means that it is less addictive. The majority of participants thought that was false. So this whole idea and enterprise of reducing the nicotine content in cigarettes our, our general public does not understand that reducing the nicotine content reduces the uh, addictiveness of the product. And then finally, related to health risks, um, the majority of our participants believed that, um, that nicotine caused a large, a relatively large or a very large part of the cancer caused by cigarette smoking and or generally that nicotine was responsible for a relatively large or very large part of the health risks associated with smoking. So all of these together um, signaled that, that we needed to do some work and, and others in this, others in our field have been doing similar work and documenting these very, um, the misperceptions in the public in other data sets. About, over about 20 years um, of, of studies, we've seen some, some consistent misperceptions of the role of nicotine in health harms, um, including nicotine being responsible for most of the health harms and cancer caused by smoking. That nicotine replacement therapy or NRT is as harmful to health as smoking. Uh, not over the past 20 years, but uh, over the past 10 or so, that e-cigarettes are as or more harmful to health than cigarettes. And then finally, that reduced nicotine content cigarettes are less harmful than average cigarettes. So in contrast to what I shared earlier, there's not an understanding of the addictiveness of uh, a, a reduced nicotine content cigarette, but there is generally a belief that 
lowering the nicotine content in a cigarette actually reduces the harm of that product. And some of the most compelling studies that I have seen uh, on this topic are where a, in a lab study, participants are given identical cigarettes, told that one is an average nicotine content cigarette and one is a low nicotine content cigarette, and then asked to rate the product. Um, and in those cases, the, the product they believe is a low nicotine content cigarette is the one that they describe as being less harmful to health, uh, despite that the product is identical. So this led to some initial work that, um, that we did uh, with colleagues, including Eric, Donnie, Darren Mays, Joe Capella, Andrew Strasser, and Julia West on how we could potentially message about nicotine uh, to change these beliefs. So we ran a, a study in um, Amazon Mechanical Turk where we exposed participants to six experimental messages. Um, we developed these messages from um, evidence-based sources. We tried to change the wording to make them a little bit more relevant to a lay audience, but we used the FDA's 2017 Comprehensive Plan for Tobacco and Nicotine Regulation, the FDA's 2013 modifications to the labeling of NRT products, the 2014 Surgeon General's report on the health consequences of smoking, and then reports on carcinogens from IARC that, uh, that concluded that nicotine was not a cause of cancer. So these were the six messages that participants saw in our Amazon Mechanical Turk study. Uh, first was that nicotine is the addictive substance in tobacco products. Second, nicotine makes it easier for people to start smoking regularly. Third, nicotine makes it harder for people to stop to quit smoking. Fourth, nicotine does not cause cancer. Fifth, cig chemicals in cigarette smoke, not nicotine, largely cause cancer, heart disease, and other health problems related to smoking. And finally, nicotine can be used safely long term in quit smoking products like nicotine patches, gum, or lozenges. So we had uh, a little over 500 participants um, in a nicotine messaging condition, about half were in a nicotine messaging condition, and then the other half were split between a no message control or a series of six messages on sun safety. We did not have differences between those groups, um, and so we combined them for these analyses. And what we showed was that exposing people to this brief six slide um, message intervention dramatically changed their beliefs. So in the nicotine, um, the nicotine messaging condition, we had, you know, a, a large proportion switching, uh, saying that that was false um, compared to the control condition. We saw that a larger proportion of um, participants in the nicotine messaging condition saw that nicotine was none or a small part of health risks. Uh, none or a small part of cancer caused by cigarette smoking. And then we had this significant difference when we summed all of these up, um, we had fewer false beliefs about nicotine in the nicotine mes messaging condition than the control condition. And all of these were significant. So we had a similar uh, series of, we had, we had a series of items related to false beliefs um, on other um, nicotine related, nicotine containing um, products as well, including NRT, e-cigarettes, and reduced nicotine content cigarettes, which are labeled here as RNC. And so what you can see is that across all of these false belief scales, we were able to reduce the number of false beliefs in the nicotine messaging condition compared to the control condition after this single brief exposure. And again, all of those were significantly different. So that was great. We, that was really exciting. And we felt like, um, you know, that was the impetus for putting a project forward where we proposed to expose people more frequently. So we saw this dramatic effect in a uh, single exposure, very brief study. What would happen if we extended that exposure over a 12 week period? And so we have, um, we received an R01 last year 
uh, Andrew Strasser and I to do a, a two phase study. The first was to do a population trial in which we exposed participants to nicotine messaging four times over the study period. Um, and then the second and, and assessed their beliefs um, and their intention and use of tobacco and nicotine products uh, at three points over this study, study period. And this was meant to mimic what, might, what a person might be exposed to with a mass media campaign um, that was running in their area. So they would be exposed to these messages you know, uh, a few times over a 12 week period. The second study was, is the study that Andrew is running and that is focused on a lab-based study where people are actually coming into the lab um, and getting exposed to these messages in the way that they might if they were coming in weekly or buying tobacco products weekly and exposed to these messages at the point of sale or on a pack. And so we have, um, we have completed the AIM-1 trial and the AIM-2 trial is underway now. And I'm gonna be presenting some preliminary findings from that population study. So the specific AIM-1 um, that's focused on the population study was to test the impact of nicotine corrective messaging on nicotine beliefs and subsequent impact on intention and use of nicotine and tobacco products in a national sample of adult smokers and non-smokers followed for 12 weeks. So we hypothesized that adults in the nicotine um, corrective messaging condition would report fewer false beliefs about nicotine, NRT, e-cigarettes, and reduced nicotine content cigarettes. We also thought they would report lower intentions to use tobacco and nicotine products at follow-up compared to those in the control condition. Um, we thought that cigarette smoking would moderate the effect so that there would be a um, smaller effective nicotine uh, corrective messaging on, on cigarette smokers compared to non-smokers. I'm not gonna be presenting data on intention and use today, but I am gonna be presenting on the beliefs data. So our sample was um, a, a, a study um, run in the AmeriSpeak panel with NORC, um, where we enrolled 794 US English speaking adults age 18 plus. They were recruited um, in, the, in the spring of this year. And uh, the AmeriSpeak panelists received an email invitation describing the study and interested panel members were directed to complete the initial baseline. We had, um, as I mentioned, this uh, four exposure period. So we, um, at the end of the baseline survey, participants came in, they completed the baseline survey. At the end of the baseline survey, they were randomized to either the nicotine um, corrective messaging condition or the delayed messaging control condition. So they completed all of their baseline measures and then they were randomized to, uh, to their exposure and the the people who were in the nicotine corrective messaging condition saw their first exposure um, at the end of the baseline study. So you can see here our, um, the first few weeks of our study were in February and uh, essentially February into the beginning of March. We had 393 participants in the intervention condition and 401 in the control. They came back, they completed their key outcome measures and then the uh, nicotine corrective messaging conditions saw their second exposure. So we were never measuring um, their, our key outcome measures in close proximity to the exposure. There was always a lag between the time they were exposed and the time um, we assessed our outcomes. Um, we had great retention, about 80% in the intervention condition, 79% in the control. Wave three was just an exposure, um, a, 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 an exposure survey. So only people in the intervention condition got that survey and there were no outcomes assessed at that time point. And then at the final wave, which happened in um, April and May, we assessed the key outcome measures and then everyone saw the last exposure and we assessed um, perceived message effectiveness, credibility of the measures of the messages um, in both groups. So we had pretty good retention over time. Um, and uh, as you can see, the study took place from February through May 
So in addition to our six messages that we had tested before, we added two additional messages um, specifically related to e-cigarettes and low nicotine cigarettes. Um, so we included a, me a message that e-cigarettes may expose users to significantly lower amounts of toxic substances than regular cigarettes, but they can contain as much or more nicotine. And then the other message was low nicotine cigarettes are as harmful as regular cigarettes, but they may help people quit and prevent new users from becoming addicted to smoking to cigarettes. So our primary outcome measures, um, again, nicotine false beliefs, NRT false beliefs, e-cigarette false beliefs, and reduced nicotine content cigarette false beliefs. We had these secondary outcomes that were intention to use nicotine or tobacco products and actual use behavior. Um, but we, we assessed a number of other things, um, sociodemographics, literacy, cancer risk beliefs and behaviors, um, and additional items about uh, attitudes about nicotine, nicotine related norms, stage of change and policy support. So the analyses that I'll be presenting today are mainly bivariate analyses where we looked at differences in demographic characteristics by study condition. We looked at differences in demographic characteristics by those who we retained in the study versus, versus those we lost to follow up. Um, and then we looked at some primary outcomes by study condition at wave four um, by any tobacco use status, any past 30 day tobacco use status at baseline. We also used linear mixed models to examine differences in the false belief scale scores by study condition over time. Um, and we thought that, you know, again, current tobacco use might moderate the effect of the messaging on our primary outcomes. And we're also looking forward to doing more exploratory analyses of how um, other potential moderators may be influencing the relationship between the messaging and um, our, our false beliefs. So this is just a brief, um, a, a snapshot of part of the table um, showing that the, we, had, we had generally good balance across our intervention and control condition with respect to sex, age, um, and, and all of the other variables that we assessed at baseline, but I'm just showing here. Um, so you can get a sense that our, our, um, the proportion of people that were um, past 30 day smoker cigarette users are is about 15% that was consistent across conditions and about 10% were daily cigarette um, smokers and this is essentially what the what NORC would call the natural fallout of, um, of tobacco use that's generally in line with what we see at the national level. So we had no differences in the distribution of demographic characteristics by study condition. That was good. Um, and what we saw was that um, nicotine false beliefs uh, assessed at follow-up at that wave four follow-up, we had no difference in, um, in the number of nicotine false beliefs held by our intervention or control participants. We did see fewer nicotine NRT related false beliefs in the intervention group compared to the control and fewer e-cigarette false beliefs in the intervention group compared to the control. And again, no difference in the reduced nicotine content cigarette false beliefs. We also looked at longitudinal models um, assessing the effect of the intervention on false beliefs over time. We saw no difference uh, no effect of time uh, or, ex or dose of exposure essentially over time. We saw that there was a past 30 day, that past 30 day tobacco use was associated with fewer nicotine and e-cigarette false beliefs, uh, just like we saw in the full sample and was past 30 day tobacco use a moderator of that relationship? Uh, generally, no. <laughs> so we expected to see that, that um, false beliefs would be attenuated in tobacco users compared to non-tobacco non users. We really didn't see that either, though there was a marginal relationship um, with, between uh, past 30-day tobacco use moderating the effect on e-cigarette false beliefs. Again, that was marginal 
The graphs though paint a slightly different picture. Um, and again, these are not sig statistically significant, um, but what we can see here, the intervention group is in blue on all of these slides, on all of these images, and the control condition is in orange. And what we can see here is that for the nicotine false beliefs, the participants are generally starting at the same point and we see more of a decline over time in the intervention group. Um, for uh, the NRT related false beliefs, there's overlap um, in the number of false beliefs and it really stays pretty parallel over time. Um, and sort of similarly for, similarly for the e-cigarette false beliefs, um, the, the um, number of false beliefs held remains relatively consistent um, over time. And there's really no difference um, between the uh, reduced nicotine content cigarette false beliefs regardless of condition. So to me, this gives us some hope that um, there may be something working about the messaging related to nicotine um, certainly, we are seeing the differences in NRT and in e-cigarette false beliefs um, overall, but we're really not seeing any difference in the reduced nicotine content cigarette messaging. So conclusions. Our pilot study supported that a single brief exposure to a subset of messages reduced false beliefs about nicotine, NRT, e-cigarettes, and reduced nicotine content cigarettes. Um, our current findings suggest that repeated exposures to nicotine corrective messaging reduced false beliefs about NRT and e-cigarettes, but had no impact on false beliefs about reduced nicotine content cigarettes. So despite the lack of a significant intervention, as I mentioned, the effect um, on the nicotine beliefs looked promising over time in terms of there being some differentiation between the intervention and control group, though this was not significant. Um, the one thing I just want to highlight here is another reason, there are many reasons why we might be seeing uh, a different outcome than we saw in our pilot study. Um, and one of them that I think is really important to note is that we had a lag every time we assessed the outcomes, there was a lag between when they saw the messaging and when they reported the outcome. And that was generally several weeks. And so they saw the messages in the, um, in the brief exposure, the, the MTurk study, they saw the messages and they responded right away about their beliefs. So there may be some, some uh, issue there in terms of the delay in, in uh, assessing the outcomes, the delay between the exposure to the stimuli and assessment of the outcomes. Promising news, though, was that generally um, when we exposed everyone to the messages at the very end of the study, uh, they, they generally found them to be both uh, effective. They were above the midpoint of the scale for perceived message effectiveness. And you can see here um, on each specific item, they were, uh, they were above the midpoint of that scale, but there was no difference whether you had seen the messages three times before or whether you were seeing them for the first time in the control condition. Um, and similarly, we did not have any differences uh, with respect to message credibility. So again, um, all, of our, all of our measures of uh, message credibility were higher than the midpoint of the scale, which is uh, promising. Um, and they did think that the messages were generally accurate, authentic, or believable. But again, there was no difference between the intervention and control condition on how uh, on, on those ratings. So what are the implications of this work? Um, first, corrective messaging on nicotine can reduce false beliefs about NRT and e-cigarettes. They may also impact false beliefs about the harms of nicotine. They did not impact false beliefs about reduced nicotine content cigarettes. So this is an area where we have more work to do um, and more to understand. We need future research to optimize the content of this nicotine corrective messaging, um, as well as messaging to educate the public on reduced nicotine content cigarettes. One of the problems here, and I think in, in many of our studies, is that a reduced nicotine content cigarette is largely a hypothetical construct to consumers. 
they may have been exposed to a couple of brands that, um, that do sell reduced nicotine content cigarettes, but these are not a mainstream product that they're being exposed to. As I mentioned earlier, our AIM2 lab-based study actually directly addresses this um, in a two-by-two -two design where uh, half of the participants will receive normal nicotine content cigarettes and, and be told that they are normal nicotine content cigarettes and half will receive reduced nicotine content cigarettes and be told that they are reduced nicotine content cigarettes and they will get the nicotine corrective messaging intervention or the delayed message control. So this is a study where people, where this is focused on um, adults who smoke cigarettes and they will be coming into the lab um, and doing uh, and receiving study product in addition to receiving the intervention. So we hope that this will give us a bit more insight into how we might be able to alter nicotine corrective messaging, um, particularly as it relates to adults who smoke cigarettes. Now, one of the things that we also have to keep in mind um, is that we are focusing in this study largely on um, false beliefs, accuracy of beliefs about nicotine and, and what other work has done, and this is a study led by Justin Byron, um, is that the more, the higher you get accurate perceptions about nicotine content or addictiveness that comes at a bit of a cost in terms of uh, consumers understanding of the cancer risk of the product. So understanding that a product has reduced nicotine is less addictive. Again, we're, we're dealing with that issue where people think nicotine is the thing that is causing the harms and that by having less nicotine, they're actually reducing their risk. So this is a trade-off that we have to figure out and we have to understand how best to message so that, they, uh, so that the accurate perceptions all go in the same direction. And so, Finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we were thinking about how this all came together and how people might understand um, a policy for uh, nicotine reduction. So we, um, we used a measure from a, a study led by Kulak et al about support for requiring reduced nicotine content cigarettes. And so using their methodology, we included um, a single item at the end of our wave four survey for all participants, where we asked them, and I apologize, this is wordy. Um, According to US law, the government can require the amount of nicotine in cigarettes to be reduced. Which of the following best describes a policy that you would support? The first option is, no ban on nicotine. I support that the levels of nicotine in cigarette vary from zero or very low levels of nicotine in some brands to high nicotine levels in others so that smokers can choose the nicotine levels they like. No nicotine levels would be banned. Second, ban on high nicotine cigarettes, keep low or moderate cigarettes, moderate nicotine cigarettes. I support that the levels of nicotine in cigarette vary from zero or very low levels of nicotine in some brands to moderate nicotine levels in others. Smokers would have some choice over the nicotine levels they like, but the high, but high nicotine cigarettes would not be sold. Third, allow only low nicotine cigarettes. I support that the only very low levels of nicotine be allowed in all cigarettes sold. Nicotine would not be banned but these low levels would not cause any addiction or nicotine effects to occur and would help increase the chances of quitting smoking. And then finally, ban all nicotine in cigarettes. I support the banning of nicotine in all cigarettes. Only nicotine-free cigarettes could be sold. This would help all nicotine effects, stop the chances of addiction and help increase the chances of quitting smoking. So we, uh, again, asked everyone this question. There was no difference between the intervention and control group, but one of the most interesting things to me was that 62% of participants supported a ban on nicotine in cigarettes, either to include only low nicotine content cigarettes or to ban all nicotine in cigarettes. 
this is an interesting thought to me in terms of how we might address messaging to leverage this support for um, a potential policy in this area. So in closing, uh, we have this ongoing challenge and I welcome any thoughts or suggestions on how, um, how we can improve this type of messaging to get the effects that we're looking for to get everyone moving in the same direction in terms of accuracy of understanding um, about nicotine versus the harms of um, cigarette smoking and other tobacco products. So the question is, how do we craft messages that improve understanding of nicotine and support accurate risk perceptions of various nicotine products and support accurate risk perceptions of health consequences of nicotine use, largely smoking, and maybe harness support for nicotine reduction. I want to thank many of my collaborators on these two projects and also my team at UVM who have been working on this, um, this work with me. And um, sorry that we're all not here in person. So I wanted to share a little foliage and my favorite VCBH conference treat, a maple creamy to toast all of you. So thank you. You're muted, Eric. Thank you. No, no better way to end the conference by a little more muted uh, talk. Um, so thank, I just wanted to say thank you, Andrea. That was very interesting and, and an amazing way to, to leverage that national data at the end there to get a really interesting insight into where to go next with this. Um, so I'm going to open up the Q&A. We have plenty of time. Um, and here it is, okay. Um, and we have some questions in the chat. I will go order they were received. Um, okay, so this isn't this might be uh, to Eric because <laughs> this came in pretty early. It says the F this is from Mike Cummings. FDA has discussed a level of nicotine in the tobacco, uh, product of 0.2 to 0.7. Can you comment on this level in contrast to the 2.4 milligram per gram levels mentioned? Sure. So yeah, I saw that. Um, and first of all, that was just evil, Andrea, putting the picture of the maple creamy up there. It was not appropriate. Um, so next year. Um, the um, So a couple points to clarify. So one is the, the 0.2 to 0.7 uh, milligrams of nicotine per rod. Uh, just as a reminder, what's in a rod is about 0.7 grams of tobacco, 700 milligrams. So I, when I list things, I always report it as milligrams per gram. And the reason I prefer that over milligrams per rod is because I think that any nicotine standard would need to be extended to other combusted tobacco products, particularly little cigars and cigarillos. And so I don't want um, to imply that uh, all products have the same amount of tobacco in them. Um, so uh, the 2.4 milligrams, I was a little bit conservative in this talk because I didn't have a chance to get into the argument. Um, as to why 0.4 milligrams per gram is probably better. That's really the target that FDA is, is established. The, the short of it um, is that we see stronger effects at those lower doses, particularly uh, on dependents. Um, and any concern you have about heterogeneity in the population, both in terms of potential benefits and risks, um, need to be factored into any product standard. So you wouldn't want to set a product standard that is right at the highest level, but rather at the lowest attainable level um, so, that you, uh, so that you have the benefits to the largest population, part of the population. Great, thank you. Uh, another question um, is, uh, 
from Maddie. Uh, the FDA projects that projects that reducing nicotine levels in all combustible cigarettes to just 0.5 milligrams of nicotine per gram of tobacco, a level already achieved by very low nicotine content by 22nd century group, would enable 5 million adult smokers to quit one year after implementation and over 8 million American lives would be saved by the end of the century. This is less of a question or of a statement. Um, do you, I guess, is this something that you uh, support? Is this on par with what, how you're feeling about how this could go if these are implemented? Um, so I guess I can take a stab at that first. Um, so, you know, I mean, modeling without real world data is, is always challenging, right? Um, but, um, but if we think about the, what the intent of a nicotine reduction policy is, it's built on not just the last 10 years of research, but really decades of research um, suggesting that nicotine is the primary reason that people use tobacco products. Um, and so, you know, what exactly the number is, uh, I'm not a modeler, I don't pretend to be, but, um, but I think that it is realistic to assume that it would greatly devalue um, cigarettes, um, make them by making them less reinforcing, less addictive. And, um, and that if other products are available, um, and maybe even in the absence um, of those products, um, that we should assume that smoking to smoking prevalence and intensity would greatly reduce. Um, that's, I know that's dodging the exact number, um, but the number would depend on a lot of factors, I think. Right, I think that's generally been a theme of a lot of the presentations that there's gonna be a lot of different effects in terms of substitution, um, other products and lots of areas to consider. Um, and so there are a couple questions that seem sort of similar here in, in, in talking about how, uh, well, why, why isn't the FDA acting on this? Um, and just sort of asking for general thoughts from the panel on, on, on why you think these um, this might be taking so much time, given the evidence that seems kind of strong, very, well, it seems almost overwhelming in, in, in favor of doing this, that you've been describing. So anybody can jump comment? in on the last question, and then I'll add to that one. Um, you know, I think the, the estimates that are produced by FDA, they they could even be conservative depending on what else we have at play um, and how much cessation support we can provide and, uh, and promote at the time of the policy. So I think, you know, thinking about what are the other levers, this is one lever um, and we have many other tools that we should be deploying at the same time to be driving down tobacco use to support people in cessation or reducing their use. Um, you know, when we, when these simulation models uh, project effects where you see the greatest, uh, the greatest benefit is by getting people to quit. It's the adult smokers. And then 20 years down the line, you then get the, uh, the effects of reduced initiation. So the more that we can do um, to reduce cigarette use, reduce combustible tobacco use, the, the closer we'll get or the higher, um, the greater benefit we'll achieve. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions in the, the Q and A um, from Jared. Um, um, the FDA's plan has been to reduce nicotine in, in cigarettes to non-addictive levels, but they also just banned most of the vape devices that were submitted through the PMTA process. How can we move forward from here? Uh, nicotine reduction policy doesn't seem like it would be successful about these alternative devices. I'll, <laughs> that could be I'll take, I mean, I, I don't know that it 
that's the case. I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced that it wouldn't be successful without, um, without complementary alternative nic sources of nicotine. And, and we still have alternative sources of nicotine available. Um, and as Andrea was saying, this is not a standalone thing. We have, this is meant to work in concert with treatments and with other tobacco control policies. So I think regardless of what the FDA does with the PMTAs for e-cigarettes, this is a very valuable policy that should go forward. Yeah, and, and I guess I would add that I don't view what has happened so far as the end of the vaping industry either. Um, I, there's a lot more coming. Uh, Andrea, I'm sure can speak better to this than I can, but I think it's an overstatement um, to suggest that that those products won't be available as alternatives. And I certainly hope that's not the truth, the case, but Andrea is the, the expert here. No, I mean, we see the non-tobacco, non tobacco-free nicotine products that are emerging and are very prevalent and overtaking our standard vaping products in young people. And uh, it's unclear at this point how they're going to be regulated. Um, will they fall under the Center for Tobacco Products? And if so, how, how do they enter that um, how do they how did they create a new product application? Because I don't think they were on the market prior to the 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 date, the grandfather date. I have another question from the QA uh, for Dr. Donnie. It's from an anonymous attendee. Uh, the question goes. In your research on very low nicotine content cigarettes in the experimental tobacco marketplace, how were participants oriented to the nicotine manipulation? Oh, um, sure. So uh, they are told in that study, and that study is ongoing, but there it's an unblinded um, study. They're told that they will be randomized to one of two cigarette conditions. And that um, one of the conditions has very low nicotine in the cigarettes uh, and the other that has normal amounts of nicotine in the cigarettes. And that information is provided also within the context of the online marketplace. So, you know, this is, this is an area where, again, I think Jen was referring to the fact that we often have taken very conservative approaches by blinding people to the nicotine content, I'd argue that we're most likely underestimating the impact of nicotine reduction. Um, that it is um, part of, expectancies are an important part of, of that effect. Um, and so, you know, giving them more transparent information, more real world information um, allows them to act you know, kind of in a more informed nicotine consumer way um, in that marketplace. So, um, but yeah, they're, they're told very clearly that they have very low levels of nicotine. We don't get into, at least I don't remember getting into very like long descriptions of what that means. We debated round and round about whether to do that and recognize that not, not the majority of the people that are coming in are not uh, like us. They don't think about nicotine and cigarettes 24 seven. And so we would just cause problems if we got too, um, too wrapped up in that. Thank you for that. Uh, another question from the Q&A from Mike Cummings goes, Andrea, I'm, I'm skeptical that messaging will make much difference without giving people giving people being switched to very low nicotine cigarettes, without giving people being switched to very low nicotine cigarettes. Eric's studies show that consumers figure out that the very low nicotine cigarettes are non-reinforcing and report feeling like they have more choice as to whether to smoke or not. So this goes exactly to what Eric had just said, um, yeah. Eric Donnie had just said, that there is a, uh, you know, we're moving into a different set of studies where people are being told about the products they're getting. And I think that will really help us to understand the real world consequence and especially the, the study that um, Andrew Strasser and I are running right now. 
uh, where people are getting messaging and the reduced nicotine content cigarette and they know what product they're getting, they're, they're not being blinded to that. I think all of that will help us to understand how the messaging and the product interact in a way that's been really hypothetical uh, until now. That's a great point. <clears throat> um, and that anonymous question earlier, Eric, that was from uh, Caitlin Browning, a postdoc at the VCBH. So she unanonymized herself. Um, I, I had sort of a, a, a thought um, when talking about messaging and, and uh, even you know very low nicotine content cigarettes and NRT. I, I somehow draw the parallel to uh, non-alcoholic beer for some reason and how that might be perceived and how thinking about how that's perceived by people uh, and, and its popularity um, might be a sort of bellwether for how reduced nicotine or nicotine replacement might be considered because from from my experience, it seems like reduced nicotine, or I mean, sorry, like medicinal nicotine um, is is not very not. It has a sort of stigma around it itself, um, and I'm just wondering how, um, in, in terms of messaging, um, those sorts of experiences might be um, considered in developing this. What do you think about that? I think there is a huge market of non-alcoholic beer that has emerged and artisan craft non-alcoholic beer has been a huge thing on the scene in the past couple of years. And given that we're in sober October and dry January and all of these times when, um, you know, when I, when I think about that, when I look it up, that's the first ad that gets served to me is, um, you know, understanding how do we think about these types of products? How do we think about um, promoting quit attempts? And this idea of taking a break seems to be relevant. So um, I, you know, thinking about, I, I had not thought about reduced nicotine content cigarettes as a break <laughs> if, we, if we tested that out and had a great marketing campaign, maybe we could get more people on board. Um, but I do yeah. think there is there is some, um, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, the like I said, the the breaks, the the dry January or the sober October that have gained um, cultural um, relevance, and thinking about cannabis tolerance breaks, and we don't think about that really in terms of um, cigarette smoking, but it's a I think there is an opportunity to align some messaging in, in those areas. Yeah, I think it's an it's an interesting question. I mean, in, in some ways, they're quite different because uh, uh, you know, a reduced nicotine standard would be a, a mandate. It wouldn't be offered along wouldn't be offering these low nicotine cigarettes alongside normal nicotine content cigarettes on the market the way low alcohol beer or non alcoholic beer is. So in some ways, they're quite different. But I do think it's a, powerful, you know, the suggestion is quite pow potentially powerful. The idea of giving people choice back. Um, now there's no nicotine or low nicotine and they're not addicting you. You may choose to continue to use them. We hope you don't, but it's that, that idea of giving people choice back could be a very powerful message. Yeah, I just want to throw in my two cents on this too. I, I, I think the idea is really an interesting one. We see in the clinical trials where people are randomized to the lowest nicotine condition who don't want to stop smoking at the beginning, that we see decreases in dependence. We see increases certainly in, in qualitative assessments of, of them finding that that period of um, being on a low nicotine product has changed or improved their mental health in some way in terms as it relates to being dependent on a substance. And so I think that's really important. I guess the other part that I just want to caution, because my, I'm, I guess I've always assumed that the best messaging around a low nicotine product standard ties the abuse liability of the cigarette to the harms. That is, we have to, t people need to understand this is not a war on nicotine. This is a war on a product that kills half of its users. And the war is fought 
and giving you control back to stop using it. Like that's, it has to be about health um, to me for it to get very far as a, as a product standard. Right, and, and these results that you have been shown throughout the conference that is, this has a benefit on people's mental well-being and, and their symptoms of all, all, all these, um, all these sim, you know, symptoms of why people are feeling bad, just, just taking this away or, or stopping doing this has these you know, great effects on, on people's general well-being. And that should, of course, be emphasized. Absolutely. Um, and so if there aren't any more questions and answers, and, and if our panel does not like, want to make more <laughs> um, pronouncements, I, I would like to take the last few minutes of the conference to turn it over, well, well to make a last couple announcements, and then turn it over to Steve Higgins for some last, uh, some from concluding comments on the conference. Um, so there are a couple of upcoming things to, <clears throat> to announce. Uh, please check out the event webpage for conference videos and slides in the upcoming weeks. They'll be coming out on there. Um, please claim your CME credits um, and, if, and you may email the follow up or email us follow up. Um, and I'd like to remind everybody of the VCBH monthly lecture series. Uh, the next lecture is November 17th at noon with Gail D'Onofrio, uh, Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Yale School of Medicine. Um, and please join our mailing list to follow us on social media for more updates from the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. Um, and now I'll, I'll turn it over to Steve and stop sharing. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, great job, Chairness, and and to the speakers. Wow, a great panel. Um, and uh, really, what I want to do is just uh, thank uh, for while I'm thinking of it, thank Nicole Tuick for her help in organizing this, and then for being the technical person throughout, just making sure that she's there to problem solve as any issues come up. So uh, thanks a bunch, Nicole. It's been great. Um, and then not only the speakers in this panel, but all of our speakers have been, I don't know what I thought coming into it, but I'm blown away at how good the presentations were from the beginning to the end. And I, I just smiled to myself that Amanda Graham kicked us off and Andrea Valanti um, finished, you know, so the book ends and both of them were great. And then we didn't have any drop off. It was just this straight line and, uh, and I'm thrilled. And I also recognize how, how much goes into preparing a, a good presentation. So everybody really um, devoted considerable time to this conference and I greatly appreciate it. I think it's great for the field. Um, so, so thanks to all the chairs and the speakers and um, you know, then the audience. Um, I've been watching a number of participants and that too is pretty stable all the way through here on a Friday afternoon. And I'm sitting in Vermont and it is just gorgeous out. And so I'm sure that's that's the part the case for many places uh, where our listeners are seated. So um, the scientific goal was, you know, how do we get to the end game and the idea that we're gonna have to innovate, we're gonna have to really focus we need tobacco control and regulatory scientists working together. We had them both at this meeting. Well, some, some of us are both, many of us are both, but um, we had presentations on both uh, at this meeting. And the idea was, um, you know, innovate. What, what can we do that's new? What, what ideas can we bring up that would move us forward? And, and right up through this last panel, we've been really hearing you know, great ideas and seeing great evidence. So we've been getting empirical, um, really wonderful uh, empirical evidence, but also conceptual um, contributions, just how to think about things. You know, I loved it in Neil Benowitz's um, uh, Q&A after his keynote, uh, the people were asking, well, how come Neil, you know, we've got these studies going in these things in the UK, but not the US and usually US leads. And of course, you know, he, he knows a lot and he knew how um, the, the uh, issues at the FDA of if you wanted to do an e-cig trial and get, have to get an IND, it's, it's very difficult. 
political, but then he also had a recommendation, you know, that they could potentially have a policy that exempted e-cigarettes for, you know, trials to, to accelerate that. You know, so it's just an example that stands out in my mind uh, as an innovation that, and, and, and they were just every session and almost every talk or probably every talk, uh, you know, was contributing both really good ideas and, and good evidence. So that, that I'm thrilled by that. Um, we do plan to do a special issue of preventive medicine. It would be uh, issue number nine in this series. And issue number eight, these things are synchronized where the one from the following year, it comes out around the same time as we're holding this conference. So number eight on um, rural addiction and um, health is coming out uh, in a couple of weeks. And I will be in touch with all the speakers uh, to see if you uh, would like to con contribute to this next special issue. Um, I, I hope everybody accepts. It doesn't have to be exactly what you presented here, but it gives you an opportunity in the area in which you spoke in this conference to develop your ideas into a written uh, contribution. So um, again, thanks to everyone. And I think with that, I'm gonna let everyone get on with their weekends and, and just know that I, I just, couldn't be happier with how all this transpired. So thank you, thank you. Goodbye.